Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney. And I had to click record because Mark and I just could have gone forever uh, because we're talking about RVN. But you know, the name of the podcast is Construct Your Life. And before you tell your story, Mark, how many people do you meet when they find out you're RV and they go, man, I've dreamed of that my whole life. I hear it a lot. A and lot. I say to and you can do it too. Uh, you know, that's, that's true for the most part, but people get in their own way. That's a, an amazing point. And when you were young, uh, like I, you got in your own way. So do you want to tell us about the story of Mr. Owens? Uh, I'll try to keep it short because it, I usually, it goes on and on. So I grew up in Baltimore City, blue collar neighborhood, uh, most of the guys that I hung out with, their dream was to like get a job driving a forklift at a factory and like then you're set for life. Uh, buy a little row house to live in, you know, have like 1.7 kids and a old Ford <laughs> and that was it. And uh, and that was fine with me. I always thought there was more, but that was, you know, but that was like my neighborhood's expectation. And then when I was around 12 years old, I started smoking weed and cigarettes. And in my neighborhood, that's like kind of the norm. So a lot of times people are shocked by it, but you know, in Baltimore city, in, in those types of neighborhoods, that was kind of the average stuff. And uh, that progressed and really got out of hand. I, I didn't know it at the time, but I was a drug addict. And you know, when I was 17 years old, I got kicked out of high school in my senior year, started you know, shooting Coke and heroin when I was you know, 17. And once you get into that lifestyle, then that takes like, that's like a, a whole different set of problems that that creates. And so I spent like the next eight years in and out of jails, rehabs, uh, sleeping in like what we call bandos, abandoned houses, you know, under bridges, like whatever. And, uh, and I, I was, I'd been periods of homeless in uh, West Hollywood, California, Jacksonville, Florida. Pennsylvania, Maryland, and uh, and I was you know I was getting a lot of trouble. I was getting you know locked up for some stupid stuff and some stu you know serious stuff. And when it finally ended in uh, September of 1989, the last time I got locked up, I had a bank robbery in Philadelphia, uh, a couple of dozen commercial robberies in the state of Maryland, and then some other stuff that's like you know, like stolen cars and stuff like that. Like stuff that, you know, when you compare it to that, it's like nothing. Uh, just a bunch of stupid stuff like that. And I got locked up September 89. About a month later, I tried to escape out of the detention center because uh, I wasn't done. You know, I was just like getting a, getting arrested was never part of my equation. My, my equation was get high, get shot, overdose. Well, you know, like that was how it was going to end. Uh, it wasn't going to be going to prison for years. And so I tried to escape. I say, fortunately, now I didn't. I'm glad I tried because once I got called, I got put on lockup for six months where you're like in a cell by yourself for 23 hours a day. And so it gave me, you know, a lot of time to think without getting distracted, playing spades or poker, or, you know, watching TV or all the other dumb stuff that you're doing out on, on the pod. And uh, my attorney came to see me. And I'm going to tell you like verbatim, like the conversation exactly as I remember it. I sat across the steel table in the little, you know, attorney prisoner room. And he looked over at me and he said, man, what the fuck is wrong with you? Can't you even stay out of trouble in jail? Like you're already locked up. And then he said, don't you realize that if you do what you're supposed to do, you can be home by the time you're 30 years old, you'll be young enough to start a whole new life. And of course I felt, you know, like I could just feel myself shrinking on the inside as he's telling me like, you know, that I'm an idiot. And I knew he was, what he was saying was true. <laughs> and I was like, 
you know, I, uh, I grew up with a normal family for the most part that was, you know, you know, nobody else in my family was doing the stuff I was doing. I knew better. And over the next few days, I thought about what he said. And uh, I hadn't given that really any thoughts before he said that because I'd already tried rehabs. I tried churches. I tried moving to different states. I tried like girlfriends that are like normal. Like I tried everything I could think of and nothing worked. And I just thought that that was it. And once he said that, I thought, okay, I got to do the time. He said I can be home by the time I'm 30. I was about 24 at the time. And I thought, well, you know what? Let me figure this out. I got plenty of time to think, plenty of time to work on my stuff. And, uh, and I'm going to put myself in the, the best position that I can. So when I do get out, I can have a, you know, a, a good start, a fresh start to, you know, to build up a, like a normal life. And uh, it was about four years and eight or nine months later that I got out. And uh, that was June of 94. So that's been like, I can't even do the math, almost 30 years. And I've been doing good ever since. <laughs> it's like I married my high school sweetheart, you know, had an amazing son. Uh, I started out when I got out of prison, I was making $6 an hour working in a, in a factory. And uh, I enrolled in University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I was actually a biochem major, which most of my friends are shocked to hear that I would be interested in that. But I was like, I'd always liked the sciences. And then I saw there weren't any jobs in that and I got the computer stuff. And then I went from the computer stuff to, uh, I started making really good money and I started buying rental properties with only with the intention of if I lose my computer job, I've still got money coming in to pay my, you know, to pay my mortgage and put food on the table. My wife uh, quit her job. She didn't work for five years. We had our son and she wanted to stay home with him. And then, uh, and she wanted to go back to school. She had a bachelor's degree, but she wanted to become a registered nurse. So she had to go back to school for a couple of years. And I was making enough money where, you know, back then, this is like 2000, 2001, 2002, I was making around 130 to 150 a year, which it's good today. But back then, you know, that was like really good money. And, uh, and I just, I'd saved and saved and saved. I was really financially like responsible like I didn't as my income increased uh I didn't increase my like living expenses that much if my income went up 50 percent I increased my cost of living 10 percent and so that gave me the ability to like save a lot of money and I tried the stock market stuff and uh I just felt like that was like more of a casino than anything you know when the market's going up everybody's making money and when the market crashes everybody's losing money and it's like you don't have a whole lot of uh there's, you don't have a lot of control over the market ups and downs and you can try to time the market, but for the most part, people lose when they do that. And, uh, and I'd, I'd realized that and I decided that rental properties were the, you know, the way for me to go just to, just to supplement my income. And that didn't even supplement my income. Like all the money just stayed in the bank. But I thought if I, you know, get hit by a bus or whatever, that at least there's enough coming in, you know, for my wife to, you know, maintain like a, a basic standard of living. And that's how the whole real estate thing started. But I will shut up because you might have some questions. No, I love it. Uh, a story I've never shared on the podcast. Nobody's ever heard it. Actually, only two people have ever heard it. Probably my ex-wife and somebody else. I wasn't doing it to do it. But like, it just so happened that I started selling weed when I was like 19. Mm -hmm. And it just was like, I was in an area that couldn't get it. I could get it. So I just started selling weed. It's not a big deal. Everybody at the restaurant smoked weed. That was fine. And he goes, yeah, you're making some real money, but you could be really making some real money if you sell cocaine. And so mm -hmm. I went and got it. It's in the back of my trunk. I get to work and I open the trunk and I look at the cocaine. And this is the exact thought that came through my head. If you do this, that's a different level. There's no that's turning back. And I literally, I literally shut the trunk drove right back to Houston and handed it right back over. And I think to myself, how different would my life be? That's probably one of the best decisions that you ever made. Because if I knew you had that cocaine in your trunk, <laughs> I would, I mean, I robbed a lot of drug dealers, you know, I, yeah. I just, I, I don't, well, right that's around. a great point. It's not about the money or what you would do. It's the people that you would be in business with. Yes. 
the, the ramifications of that that nobody talks about. Oh, it's it's that, and it's also if you get caught. You know, if you get caught with a you know quarter pound of weed, you know most places, you know you're not going to go to jail for ten years. You get caught with a four ounces of cocaine, you're you're going to be going to prison. And and it, it is crazy, right? Because something you said to me really hit me, right? My dad was a doctor. I lived on a country club. I lived next to basketball players for the Rockets. Like we were in a nice neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And yet I got introduced. My parents divorced when I was 17. I got introduced to cocaine that turned into meth that turned into, I was homeless, you know, that whole thing. And then was an alcoholic for 20 years. I've been sober for four, four years and three months, but you as well, you had a family and it was fine. And there was nothing too crazy. What, you know, there's so many people that I've helped or that are listening to that are in recovery that have spiraled, right? And, mm -hmm. I, and I realized that when you really start fixing yourself, it's when you protect against the spiral. Oh, like, absolutely. I mean, it, yes. So I'm going to, I want to share something and because this, this is like a kind of like, I really gave you like a really short version of what happened, but there were three, three major things that happened that changed everything. The first one is I got arrested. Like, and I'm actually friends with that cop today. I got his number in my phone. I mean, where I found him on Facebook like 15 years ago and just, you know, apologized to him and, you know, told him I'm really sorry for all the shit that I did. And I, you know, you saved my life and I really, really appreciate it. And I'm doing good today. And we've met since then. And we, last time we talked on the phone was probably a year and a half ago, but I've got his number. And if he ever needed me, I'd, I'd be there in a minute. Uh, so the first thing that happened was I got locked up. And then the second thing that happened was my attorney inspired me and I actually called him about a year ago and he didn't, he couldn't even remember who I was. And, uh, and I just said, listen, you know, you like, you know, you were also one of these people that saved my life. You said this and I, I recounted the, the, you know, the story and uh, he was like really surprised to hear from me <laughs> you know, it's been years and years. And he actually had me on speaker. So his whole office could hear the conversation. And uh, I can imagine when he went home for dinner that night, and he's sitting down with his wife at dinner. And he probably said, well, guess what happened to me today? <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny? That just happened to me last week. A guy, when I was living in a closet at a friend's house, my first mentor ever, I haven't spoke to him in 15 to 20 years. He ran into an, a mutual buddy of ours. And he said, he's a, he's a pastor now and runs a company. And he said, I've always wondered about this young kid that I was trying to help see that he was better than he was. Mm -hmm. And I connected with him and told him, I'm, he goes, dude, he's got a hundred thousand downloads. He's running companies. Like he's like, Oh, and he started crying. And I sent him a message and I, he, he goes, you know, I've always wondered if you actually listened to what I said. And I talked about all the things he taught me. He allowed me to be me and all this stuff. He played it in front of his congregation wow. and then put it on the podcast. And you could tell everybody was just like, and I'm like, oh my God, what a moment. And I, I feel like I like right, right now, like just listening to the story. It's like, the, you know, when people touch our lives and make a difference, like I want them to know. I, I want mm -hmm. them to know that they didn't waste their time. Like, you know, yeah. you really made a difference in my life. And I think that, you know, that just encourages people to keep doing it. Why know? do you think, you know, I, I know, I don't know mentally where you are, but I could see the steps because I've been there myself and people I've helped. Why do you think you finally listened to the attorney? Well, uh, you know what? Here's what happened. Like he inspired hope. And so I was going to say that, you know, there was three things. The first thing was I got locked up. The second thing was the attorney inspired me. And I was sitting there in the cell, you know, and I'm just like, all right, well, how am I going to do this? Because, you know, I've tried like everything I can do. I know something happens because other people get it together. So I know this is something that's possible. Uh, the, the girl that I was, what, a woman now, that I was with when I got arrested in a stolen car just after robbing a store. We were on our way back to a motel to get high. And, uh, you know, a month after I got locked up, she got clean. And she was with her new boyfriend was the guy, the first guy I ever shot coke with. And he had gotten like, a, he was a couple months clean and I didn't know anybody that was a couple months clean. That was like, what? You know, he was a junkie and now he's like, hasn't done any drugs in two months. That was just like mind boggling to me. But what it did was it gave me hope. It showed me that it can be done. Mark. Dude. It's like 
it's like I'm looking into a few, my, like, tr here, story. Uh, I joined a mastermind. I started a business with two guys that were nine months and 13 months sober. Mm -hmm. They all had, they were making 250 grand plus a year in their jobs and investing in real estate. And I say this statement all the time. People think I'm crazy. It was the first time I ever met two successful guys sober. Right, right. And they allowed me the freedom to say, hey, man, if you thought about it, and, you, and hear me out, I lost $30,000 in that business. I'll do it again and again and again because they're the reason I got sober. One of the reasons. Mm -hmm. I, man, I, I understand it. And people, like, what happens is, like, people that – that achieve that. And it doesn't just have to be like alcohol and drugs. It can be just like other successful in other ways. Um, you have the ability to inspire people without even doing anything on purpose. You're just doing, you know, working your program or whatever it is, yeah. but the life that you create, other people see it and it inspires them. And in this case, it was definitely, it gave me fuel, you know, like the rocket fuel. It just, it was just more fuel in my rocket to get me where I want to go. And, and there was a third piece that I didn't mention yet. And that was uh, after I got off lockup, I, there was a book laying on one, I got in the general population. There was a book laying on one of the tables and I went over and picked it up. And the book was called, You Can If You Think You Can. And the author's name was Norman Vincent Peale, who I later found out was more famous for writing a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Yeah. And this is April of 1990. And uh, and I picked up the book and I looked at it and I'm just like, you know, you can become anything you want to be. And like, you know, it's all this like self-help stuff. And I didn't even know they had self-help books. I mean, it was 1990, you know, it's like, I didn't even know there was a, any of this kind of stuff in existence. And so I thought, man, I'm going to read this. You know, this is like up my alley. I want to change my life. This book is about changing your life. And, and uh, what it did for me was halfway, well, halfway through the book, I quit smoking cigarettes. You could smoke in jail back then. And halfway through, I was like, I'm done. I'm taking control of my life. F the dumb shit. I'm, I'm finished. And so my clean date that I use is it's like, I can't remember the date now because it was so long ago, but it was like either April 20th or 22nd was the day mm -hmm. that it was almost like a lightning struck me. And I just like everything, everything changed. And uh, it was in an instant. I mean, I still remember the exact instant where I'm standing on a tier talking to one of my, you know, jailhouse buddies. And I'm like, you know what, Frank, I, it is the guys, I still remember his name. I don't want to say his last name for privacy, but I'm looking at him. And I'm like, Frank, man, you know what? Fuck these cigarettes. And I took a half a pack out, handed it to him. I still had like two cartons in my cell because that's like money in jail. And, uh, and that was it. I said, I'm done. I quit, man. And, and from that moment forward, everything in my life changed. And what it did was the book uh, gave me a confidence that I had never had before. Like I was always looking on the outside for the solutions. I'm looking at church. I'm looking at girlfriends. I'm looking at moving to a different state. I'm looking at the AA and the NA and the rehabs. And the truth is that the power was actually on the inside, but I couldn't use that power if I didn't believe in it, if I didn't believe in myself. And once, once I was convinced like, man, I can do whatever the fuck I want. This is my life. I'm the captain of this ship. The winds might be coming from different directions, but I can always set the sails. And once, once I had that confidence, it, it was just life-changing, absolutely life-changing. I love that. I can tell you a story because I think you'll appreciate it because life is super interesting. I interviewed another guy on the podcast, probably one of the more successful guys I've ever met in my life, dude, dude rakes and a lot of money, very successful in business. That wasn't always the case. He was mm -hmm. the largest ecstasy dealer on the East Coast for, for many, many years, Okay. His brother wound up taking the rap for him, his older brother, and kind of like kept him out of jail. Okay. Wow. So he is at the lowest of the lows. I mean, he is, he's low. He's he's feeling guilty because his brother's in jail. They're 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 not selling drugs anymore. So he has no money. You know, so I, you know, so he finds this book. Okay. Like, like, like seriously, same situation. Book. He doesn't really remember how it came to him. He didn't know if he picked it up at a thrift store or somebody handed it to him. Doesn't matter, okay? So he's in, he's on the East Coast. He's at a restaurant and just kind of looks like a druggie. And he's reading a book on a bench outside of a restaurant. Reading a book. That's all he's doing. Mm -hmm. These two, this couple walks over. 
and they start walking up to him and he goes great they're gonna they're gonna say some shit about the lord or some bullshit and he's like i don't want to fucking hear it you know he's uh-huh. trying to get his life together he said the guy says nothing grabs the book writes in it hands it back to him and he goes like oh great he's probably like you know god bless the lord blah 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 right he looks down the author of the fucking book he was reading from that lives in San Diego just walked into the restaurant he was reading the book in front of no shit <laughs> no shit and he said he said to himself he said there's something bigger at play here and he said he said that night lord i want to be a leader of men he goes cuz this couldn't be happenstance and he goes then the lord proceeded to kick my ever living ass for the next 2 years mm-hmm. to tell me that i really wanted it that's incredible. That's like the law of attraction. <laughs> you, know, like you know, and, and I, I don't believe in the woo woo, like somebody's pulling the strings, but that's, I mean, if you're familiar with like synchronicity, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, it's like that stuff, you know, that's a whole different, you know, podcast 100%. right there. But I mean, what happens is if you're observant, you pay attention, mm-hmm. you start to notice coincidences that seem like they're not related, but then you notice that there's a pattern. They really are. And then you usually don't notice till after the fact. Yes. And, mm-hmm. but as you mature and you become more aware of this, you can start to see them just after the second one. And then, you know, like, oh, synchronicity is at play. Like, and then you just wait for the next step to occur, like the, the next direction. And it, and it happens. And it's, I mean, it's giving me tingles right now talking about it because I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> it's well, like, well, what's interesting, right? And then I want to I zone in on something because I, 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 I love to talk to people about this. I tell everybody all the time when it comes to alcohol addiction, I'm just using alcohol addiction because mm-hmm. that was my thing for many years and drugs you can say too. People think I'm wild to say that it's actually not that hard to stop drinking. And I'm, I'm saying that facetiously on purpose, okay? Because it is. It's more hard to reshape your identity to who you are and who your friends see you as than it is to I, actually stop drinking. I agree with that 100%. I mean, when I was in jail, I changed, like, I even changed the music I listened to. I mean, I had a little radio and I'd start to listen to a different kind of music because I, I didn't want to have the triggers, you know, like now I can listen mm-hmm. to the stuff. I can listen to I can't listen. I can't listen to Pearl Jam, Yellow Lead better. Right. Still, because <laughs> that's what we used to do drugs to. I can't. Yeah, I get it. See, I, 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 no, but now I don't feel it. But for yeah. a couple of years there, I was like, I can't. That song reminds me too much. I get it. So I, I changed my music. I changed my, like, I changed everything I could. And then of course, then, you know, all your friends are going to change anyway, because, you know, the losers like to hang out with losers. And once you start doing good, they don't want to be around you. They want to pull you back down. And uh, why, why is that Mark? I think that's because I think there's a couple of reasons. One is because they miss you and they like you when you're fucking up like they are, you know, for that's selfish. And then also it makes them feel bad because you're just showing that you can do better. Like you don't have to, stay a drunk or whatever because mm-hmm. it, it's more that, about it's more about uh how you make them feel because you're changing and you're going to leave right them. and I, I think both of them are selfish you know for from you know for the person that is still like you know drinking or getting high or whatever they're doing you know i think that they cut you out of their lives you know for selfish reasons but it's also good for us because we need to cut them too mm-hmm. you know you can't move forward when you're still looking, you know, when you keep looking backwards and you, and your friends change as your success changes, uh, your friends change. Uh, and that's, there, there's good and bad with it. Uh, sometimes, you know, friends hold you back. Well, why are you going to do that? You shouldn't open that business. Just keep your job. You know, it's like, you know, it's like you can keep your job. You can make somebody else rich. You know, you can, you can make somebody else's dream come true. I'm going to go make my own dream come true. And uh, it, it's just different. There's so many different, you know, ways that you can look at it. But, you know, my, my friends have definitely changed. And I, and I still, have, like, I have a lot of, you know, all my friends, like, not all, but most of them drink. You know, a lot of them smoke weed. Like, I don't care. Like, I can sit in a room, you can drink all you want, smoke all the weed. But as soon as you start getting boring and laughing at shit, that's not funny. I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, I mean, yeah. I, and I hate to say this. I know it sounds arrogant and terrible, but nothing is more boring than a bunch of drunks. They're just boring. They're laughing at shit that's not stupid. They're telling the same thing over and over, and they get loud, obnoxious. It's like I'm out of here, man. Um, 
So your friends change a little bit just based on that. But the social interactions, as you know, are weird because you you know you go somewhere and people are like, "You want to drink?" Like, "Nah, man, I'm cool." You sure? Yeah, I don't drink. Why not? And you know, it's like like you're dude, doing something wrong, dude. I tell you what, the time that whipped my brain, uh, I was staying in an Airbnb at a surfer guy's house. He was in Mexico fishing, and we got to talking as I do talk to everybody through mm-hmm. Airbnb. And we started talking about how we were both in recovery and we just started talking and he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah." And so like he comes before we leave and I meet him in person and he was addicted to heroin for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And he sits, he looks at me and he shakes my hand and he goes, man, you inspire me because you got sober from alcohol. I said, what the fuck are you talking about? I said, you beat heroin. He said, bro, heroin, you can beat alcohol. It's in your face everywhere. He goes, the fact that you beat it, I'm more inspired by you. And I was like, it's true, man. I mean, it's part of our culture and and I'm like, I'm good with it. Like, this is like, when I say this, I mean, you're going to understand this on one sense and another, you might not. When, before I read that book, like when I was on the street, I'd go to A and then it was like the one day at a time. And sometimes it's like one minute at a time, you know, it's like, Mm-hmm. The urge, like, man, I really, you know, I want a beer. I want to go, like, man, I just got paid. I'm going to get an eight ball, like, whatever it is. And uh, after I read that book, I never had the urge. Dude, no, 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 no. Dude, I'm telling you, bro, you might beat my long lost brother. When I made the switch, mm-hmm. like, when I flipped it, there was one chance, 90 days in, when I got so excited talking about business with my boy, we forgot to drink and I never looked back ever again. And so you didn't have the, like the, oh my never. God. I yeah. never had him once. I was incredible? so done. I was so done. Like, and, 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 and the thing is, is like, everybody says, Why, why'd you quit? And I go, cause I got sick of mediocrity. Yeah. Well, you get sick of feeling like shit. And, and for me, it's like, I just tell people now, like, I mean, it's kind of like a joke, but you know, I was, the first time, I think this is the first time I ever saw said this. I went out climbing a mountain out. It's called Boundary Peak in Nevada. It's the highest mountain in Nevada. It was like, you know, I don't know, 12,000 feet. And uh, one of the guys that was climbing the mountain, it was like a group of us that all met some online high pointing club for Facebook. And it was like a group of like eight of us that met out there. And uh, it was like a 70 year old man. And, but he's like a mountain goat, you know. I mean, he's like he's lives in Colorado. He climbs these freaking mountains up and down for like you know sixty years. He's like he was the toughest guy in the group, and he's seventy yeah. years old. And uh, it was you know like four or five, six guys, a few women, and we get down to the bottom, and they had some you know we had coolers in our car with like sodas and waters and stuff, and they had coolers in their car with like you know beer and water. <laughs> and uh, old man looks at me, he says, "Here, want a beer?" And I was like. Uh, nah, man. I said, you don't want me drinking. If I start drinking a half hour from now, everybody would be naked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he looks at me and he says, here, take mine. <laughs> so he's a dirty old mountain goat. <laughs> yeah. No, but that's, that's what I tell people. It's like, look, man, I, you know, if I start drinking, everybody's getting in trouble. And um, well, I, just I think, I think, smile. I think, you know, one of the bigger issues for me um, this happened to me. Two two different things happened to me. One, um, my coach who has helped many men through sobriety, and I got divorced all at the same time, so it was pretty wild. I got laid off, like all in the same like ten day stretch. Um, I when I got sober, I was like, I, I don't understand how you don't you're not more excited about being sober, and I was just jamming it down every people's throat. And he was like, Hey, mm-hmm. motherfucker, shut up. He goes, Get off your high horse. Nobody cares stop. He goes, this is what you decided. Live with it. Right. And so I shut up. I shut up and I didn't say anything. I didn't talk about my sobriety. I didn't go to 12 steps. So I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't think I did it the right way. You know, all this stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, on the same day, I swear to God, the same day I got three texts from three random dudes. I hadn't spoke to in like a year and a half, two years. And they said, Hey man, I just want to let you know, I haven't had a drink in three months because of you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, I haven't, I haven't even talked to you. And I go, yeah, well, we know that you haven't been drinking and we follow your Instagram and blah, blah, blah. And they go, we decided if your dumb ass could do it, then we could do it for sure. And it clicked for me. The only way to truly inspire others is to lead 
your life through example is to that, live in your past. That's why we're here right now. I mean, this is the whole, the whole point. You know, this is why I do these. If, you know, there's, I've had calls from other podcasts where I've had people from Texas and Nevada and like other parts of Maryland, you know, get in touch with me after listening to it. And it, you know, made a difference in their life. And that's, you know, nothing, nothing makes me happier. Mark, you know that. what I did? So we just bought a company, 30 employees. The first time we ever bought an existing company. It'll be the first mm-hmm. of many. And the other owners, so I'm the CEO, not by choice. That wasn't the plan, but I just didn't like the fire that I saw in the other ones. And they, I had a way I wanted to introduce myself to the team. And people were like, my other, other owners were like, come on, man, don't, don't, don't do the way that you normally introduce yourself. And I'm like, dude, I got to. Like, it's just me. I got a role. Sure. So imagine the first time meeting your new owner, 30 plus employees, they don't know me for shit. And I say, hey, I'm Austin. I'm divorced. I used to be an alcoholic and now I'm sober. Nice to meet you. And like, boom, like four <laughs> guys walked up to me and they go, yeah, we're former recoveries. This is amazing that you're our boss now. Yeah, that's, I think that when, when you come out with that, because I'm going to tell you, like, to be honest with you, like for, I hid that part of my life for years. Like I didn't want anybody knowing. I didn't want to be judged based on stuff that I did in, in the 1980s, but people still hold that stuff against you. And, uh, and in, in the Baltimore real estate investor market where I'm at, I'm fairly well known and I speak at a lot of events and, uh, and, you know, do mentoring. And I've started some Facebook groups that have like, you know, I think the biggest one is, has over 17,000 people in it. I just gave that to somebody else last year because I'm kind of phasing out of the real estate thing. But I didn't want, for me in, in the business world, like the most important things to me were like, you know, my reputation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like being like a decent guy. And uh, I didn't want to tarnish my reputation with people finding out that I wasn't always like I am today. And it was actually during a podcast where... And I, this was never intended. It was a real estate podcast. And the guy was like, well, Mark, take me back to the beginning. I'm like, well, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> and he, I, said, he, I said, well, let me start when I was 12 years old. And then I told that story and I got it out. And uh, it was such a sense of relief to get that monkey off my back where now I'm not afraid people are going to find out. Like my close friends knew, but like I would, you know, that was it. And uh because the people that I associate with today, for the most part, really can't relate to that lifestyle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And there are some that can, but even them, it's like, you don't know who they are. I mean, most people aren't running around saying, hey, my name's Ed and I've just got 90 days. Like most people aren't doing that. So you yeah. don't know. And uh, so it was just, you know, I love these forums. I mean, you put this thing together, you put all the work into this, you put the time into this, and then you can bring people in the other people's cars you're doing all the work and it can make differences in people's lives just like the three guys that you know got in touch with you and said hey man we got 90 days clean and like the guys well, it's your business what that did it for me was a guy i hadn't talked to in uh, 18 years i used to work with i ran into him in austin six months ago and he was like hey man i just want to let you know like i don't drink anymore and i started a business because of your podcast and i'm like do what I haven't even spoke to you in 18 years. And he's like, yeah, but I listen to every episode. I love it, man. Thanks. And I'm like, that's the pay. That's the payback right there. You know I mean? It that is. makes it all worth it. When you hear stuff like that, like you've made a difference in somebody's life like that. I mean, that makes my day. When I, if somebody sends me a message about something where, you know, I it's made my a fuel, man. My I call yeah. it my currency. As soon as my wife gets home, I tell her, Hey, let me read you this email I got today. It's like, I mean, it just, it makes my day. Because you know, I want to talk, I want to unpack the real estate for a little bit because you said, you said you're getting out, which I'm intrigued. We'll, cut, we'll unpack that in just a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, you know, we've been sold this thing, especially in the last couple of years. You know, you got to burn the boats and you got to go all in in real estate. And I, I can't stand it. Like, I, you know, my goal is like as a joke, which I hate W2s, but make W2s great again. <laughs> like w, W2s bank. They, you, you're able to get a loan. My joke is I'm an entrepreneur. I couldn't get approved for a kayak right now. Yeah, I get it. I get it, man. You know what? Well, when I first started, I still had my, you know, I still had a job. I mean, I was a 1099 guy. I was a contract. I, at the end of my uh, computer uh, career, 
I was actually a Microsoft certified trainer and I was teaching these computer certification classes in colleges like all over Maryland on a contract basis. And so as my rental portfolio grew, I was able to take less and less classes. So as my, as my real estate career grew, my IT career, I just started taking less and less classes until, you know, a month, maybe two months before my wife finished school and got a job. I, I just notified the company, like the headhunter that, hey, man, I'm done. They had enough rentals were, you know, we needed 150 a year to maintain our lifestyle. I was making 50 off the rentals. My wife was going to come right out of college making like 53, 54, 55 plus insurance, which I'd, which I'd been paying for for years. So I only needed to make another 50 uh, to maintain our lifestyle. I could make $50,000 a year picking up trash. I mean, that's, you know, it's like if you're willing to work, you're, you know, you're not afraid to bust ass or get dirty. It's making $1,000 a week is easy. And, uh, and so I went full time real estate and that business absolutely took off. I mean, we can talk about that later, but that, that was really what gave me the life that I have now. And when you said, and, and we'll, we'll do another one soon, another podcast that will cover real estate, which I, is boring as shit to me. I hate talking about it. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's really simple, guys. Uh, buy an undervalued asset, make sure it cash flows, and then do it again. Wow, there you go. The secret to the but you, but, you, but you can do it with no money out of your pocket. Yeah, yeah, I'm, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why I'm buying businesses now because I love the uh, owner finance and all this crazy stuff and none of my own money. See, um, I want to talk to you about that. So Well, don't worry about it, buddy. You can. It's a 50-year business plan. I got it all mapped out. Uh, so... When you say you gave up the, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. So the Facebook group, are you, are you getting out of leading the Facebook groups and, and, or is it getting out of more passive in real estate? Yeah, I'm a, I, I had over a hundred rental units a couple of years ago. Now I'm down to like, I got like 21 left. Uh, it's, some of them were big. It was like an, I had an 18 unit apartment building. I uh, still have a 15 unit. I had a 14 unit, a 13 unit, a seven unit, a three unit, a bunch of houses. And a couple of years ago, I just, I thought, you know, 50, I'm 57 now, like 55, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, the market was going up, up, up. And I don't know how far it's going to go. And I thought, and I got a phone call from a New York investor. It was a cash buyer that wanted to buy 45 of my units at, for a good price. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this because if the market goes down and it might happen tomorrow, it might not happen for 10 years. I don't know, but I don't want to have to stay in this business another five, six, seven years or mm -hmm. right back mm -hmm. to the top. And so after I sold those, I just started selling more. I got another one I'm selling this Thursday. And uh, and then I started lending the money out. There's I'm, most people, if you're not in real estate, you won't know what this is. But hard money lenders typically lend their money out from like 10 to 18%. Short-term loans, you know, you get a mortgage on the house, you got a personal guarantee. So it's pretty safe. And now I'm just, I'm lending my money out at 12%. And uh is that the vision for the rest of your career? Yeah, because, yeah, I'm selling the rest. Yeah, I just want to do that because it's it's so easy. And uh, See, Yeah, my, my thing is very simple. I want to be the bank. And in my later careers, yeah, I want to be the bank. But more importantly, like, okay, I'll give you the quickest version I can of why we're doing what we're doing. Because mm -hmm. okay? what I'm doing is very exhausting. And the vision is so big, it would scare 90%, 99% of most people, okay? But I made a conscious decision with myself that this is what we were going to be doing. I had a six month talk with myself every morning on my walk. And I checked in with myself to make sure that what I was getting into, I wanted to, like I knew mm -hmm. what I was doing. So I just turned 40 last year. And I said, give me, give me, uh, give me 10 years, give me 11 years. I'm going to build as much as I humanly can, as big as mm -hmm. I can. I'm going to impact as many people as I can. I'm going to make as much money as I can. We're going to build this conglomerate, which we're calling a movement, not a business, right? And the only reason why we're doing that is one, to inspire communities, but I want to start an entrepreneurship school. And I had that trouble in school. Smart. I, I, dropped, I dropped out of college three times. I, I'm not a fan. I have a photographic memory. I don't care. That does, none of that stuff makes sense to me. Well, we're doing the same thing in trades. We're actually creating their own training program for trades. And I'm starting a podcast with it. And it's going to be, we're going to infuse uh, atomic habits and mindset and how to win friends and influence people back into the trades, teach them life skills and investing and stuff like that, right? So we're going we're gonna to move away from prof, per profit trade schools, which are useless, and then we're going to create our own, which is going to attach to the school. So all of my employees of all the companies can send their kids to the entrepreneurship school. So that's kind of premise, right? And then from 50 on, 
I want to start a fund that's an incubator for middle school and high school kids and their businesses. And we're going to mentor them with all my owners and my consultants and then invest in their businesses and help them go on and go. That's the basic. Man, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really fantastic vision. I mean, because what I'm hearing is the part about helping other people. Like, yeah. Because you can help people one-on-one and, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you want to help more people, you, the only way you can scale it is by putting together systems like you're talking about. And a lot, a lot of people can't do the that. The only way you can, you know, one of my favorite quotes is like, you don't actually become a leader until you teach a leader to lead somebody else. Right. And it's like, and like, the thing is, is like, when I got into one-on-one -on -one coaching, like five years ago, I was like, man, this is amazing. Like, I love my one-on-one -on -one clients. I help their family and everything, but like, this isn't, this is, I need bigger. Like I right. need bigger and that's where it. small businesses come in. Cause then you, now you infect the people that work for you in the communities and, and it just trickles down. And mm -hmm. I realized that two things, one, uh, I'm not selling anybody anything anymore. Either mm -hmm. you want to get on with the vision or you get off. There's really no other way around it. And the second thing is I only want to run races in my life that I can't win. That's my new thing because that's I realized different. I said this on a different podcast. I realized that the reason I got uninspired is because the mountain wasn't big enough. I, got, I can understand that. I can see that. Now, 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 hear me out, though. There's also a good chance that at 50 years old, I'll disappear for six months to Thailand and Nepal with my kids and my wife and then come back with 70 different ideas. But here's what's great about this idea. This idea is big enough that other people can live inside of it and carry on the torch. And I might have a different role in it right. when I get to that thing. And one of the things, my, one of my mentors of my coaching group that taught me a lot about coaching, I said, it's very powerful to know you're building something that one day is going to get so big that it's not going to need you. But that's, but isn't that the goal? It is the goal. It's, you have to make, you have to make peace with your ego. Yeah. I, yeah. That's for me. Fortunately, I've, I haven't had that issue. I mean, for mm -hmm. the stuff that I've created, like the Maryland Investors Network, you know, when I saw that I was going to start phasing out of this business. I, I looked for, you know, like, OK, who do I trust that I can give this to? Because I don't make any money off of it, but you get yeah. a lot of like respect, like, it, you know, people name recognition, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you, you do get and and tangible assets like you do benefit from it but just it doesn't show up on a spreadsheet uh or quickbooks but uh you know I, I found a guy that that could take that over and he did and i had a couple of other groups that i gave the same guy and he's he's running them better than i did but the the whole point is that you want to create something where you know after i'm gone it's still out there providing value to people you know well, and, that's and, what that's what this podcast is yeah no right you know, i mean that's, that's what this podcast is I'm about to do my 500 episode and, you know, look guys, whoever listening to this podcast, you can ask my producer about six months last year, I was getting my face pounded in, in business and I wasn't really feeling the podcast, but I still showed up for it and I still did it. Well, now the energy is back. Thanks. The That's excitement is back. And I realized that if you truly want to be the 1% and you want to do better, you got to do it when you don't want to. It's like that with everything. You know, yeah. diet, exercise, relationships with your, you know, your spouse, like whatever. Yeah. It's like, you know, even when things don't. Because I realized that like, consistency is something you can't over. Consistency will run the show no matter what. It does. And that's how I got sober. That's how I got sober. Yep. As I said, you've broken 2,000 promises to yourself. Let's keep this yeah. one. And not just yourself, but everybody else. You know, Correct. it's like. I'm sure there was a lot of damage, you know, during that period of time, you know, family stuff and job mm -hmm. stuff and health stuff, you know, that's just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just don't think about that when we're doing it. <laughs> you know, we're just thinking 100%. about it. We're in that moment. It's all about us, you know, and, you know, I'll spend my rent money on Coke and I'll worry about it next week. Well, how's that so going to happen? When you scale to a hundred units, you know, which is probably everybody's dream, you know, what my favorite question to ask is what was easier than you thought? And then I'll ask the next one. What was easier than I thought? Um, you know, I, I, nothing comes to mind because I was so driven and confident in myself. 
I was confident. And and it's, it wasn't like a false sense of confidence, like I'm going to go beat up Muhammad Ali or something. I mean, it wasn't something stupid like that, but it was just like, I'm going to work as hard as I have to. I'm going to be smart. I'm going to conserve my money. I'm not going to, you know, make 300 grand this year and run out and buy a hundred thousand dollar car. Like I'm just going to live below my means. Like I was very disciplined. And I think that if you can be, you know, discipline is huge in business and, you know, just, just to create like this wealth, like this, you know, generational wealth that everybody talks about today, um, takes a lot of discipline, you know, cause we all want it now. You know, it's like, I want to, I want a big house now. I want a nice car now. And it's hard to just say, look, what, what my priorities are, I got to put this money into my business so I can grow into something where, you know, when I was 50 years old, I was working two or three hours a day. I got a hundred doors and I'm working two or three hours a day because I put all the systems in place. And right now I'm 1600 miles from home. I still got 20, well, 22 doors. It'll be 21 on Thursday. And I can run hundred percent of my business from 1600 miles away. And, and today I probably work, if you added up all the minutes, I don't know, four hours a week. And uh, yeah, it's just, but it's discipline. It's, it's just, and it's also like, you know this because you you're a coach like you can figure everything out on your own and it's going to take this long but if you get a coach you can shorten that learning curve down to this you know like a significant amount and uh and then what can you do with that if you can say instead of having to reinvent the wheel you just your coach shows you the wheel then you can build it up a lot faster with a lot less mistakes a lot less headaches and uh and so anyway that's one of the benefits of coaching which is probably another topic as well I think that's great. And now what was harder than you thought? Man, you know, finding the people to do the work, finding people like, and I'm talking about the construction people, you know, the HVAC guy, the, the carpenters, all that, finding people that are going to show up one time, do a good job at, at a fair market rate on a consistent basis that was the hardest part is, is the people i can find i can find good real estate deals all day i can find good tenants all day it's finding the people to do the work and i and i did build up a great team which is why i'm able to you know i can buy another 100 houses in the next month and i have a team in place that could take care of just about everything but that takes a lot of time you know and you got to go through a lot of duds before you hit the you know the home run you strike out a lot before you hit a home run truth and what I tell everybody, because I've coached Airbnb for years, because that's one of my specialties. I've done all hotels and all around the country. I tell people not to launch an Airbnb in the state they live in, and they think I'm absolutely insane. And I said, no, because if it's near you, you'll be forced to go over there. And if you right. have it away, you'll be forced to be a good owner. That's a great, man, that is a really great thing for Airbnbs. Because I tell, like, my, I still do some coaching with real estate stuff, but I tell them, like, listen, like you got no business going to Home Depot. You got no business, you know, like none dude, of this. Like, dude, you're talking, dude, if I, I have so many stories about windows climbing in at 2 a.m., yeah. going to Home Depot, cleaning the toilet. Dude, yes. I was cleaning all the, I was working two jobs. I was flying out once a month. I was cleaning three Airbnbs thinking I'm saving myself so much money. And my mentor, he goes, let's do the math. Right. And he goes, right. well, you're making $2.12 an hour. And I right. almost threw up in my mouth. Right. And, but that's what I tell people. It's like, listen, you got to be able to run your, I don't care if you're running properties like three blocks down the street, you need to be able to run it from your basement or your office. Because once you can do that, your basement or office could be a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it, if you can't run your business, if you have to be hands-on like that, then you'll never be able to move to Florida or California or wherever you want to go. You got to be able to run it remotely from your house and then you can go anywhere. And that's, you know, what I've done. I've been doing it for uh, close to, uh, about a year and a half now. My wife's a travel nurse now. I love it. So if people want to find out more about you, they want to connect with you, how would they do that? Uh, it's my, probably my email address, mark at markowens.com. And that's probably the best way. I mean, I've got a Facebook page and all that stuff, but it's mostly dumb stuff on there. I love it. Well, guys, if you like this episode, send it to a friend and we'll see you next time.